Hi everyone. This morning I am absolutely thrilled to have Professor um, Lehman as my guest. So um, Professor lehman has been to New Zealand a couple of times, so today we invite him for his third visit virtually. So um, welcome to New Zealand, Professor Lehman. Good to be back, even, even virtually. <laughs> even if you are in um, isolation in Chicago. <laughs> so Professor Lehman is um, currently a professor emeritus at the University of Illinois, and he's a nutrition consultant with the food industry, is that correct? Um, he's got a really impressive research and teaching history, over a hundred peer reviews, publications, um, many awards, it's a very long um, biography, so we will put um, a list of all that in, on my website and in the show notes. So Professor Lehman is considered the godfather of protein research, <laughs> and so I'm really delighted. That implies that I'm really old, right? <laughs> <laughs> that you know lots and lots about protein. So... Um, I'm delighted you're going to um, talk to us about that today. I feel over my career as a nutritionist, protein has been really misunderstood and getting becoming quite vilified um, today. So it would be really nice to put some of those um, things to rest. So, Professor Lehman, um, to start off, would you talk about what protein is? what it does in the body and why it's an essential macronutrient? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that really is a good place to start. Um, protein is actually just a food. I always like to use the example that it's, it's like saying we need a vitamin pill. We don't really need the pill. What we need are the 12 vitamins in the pill. And with protein, protein is really just a food source of amino acids. And we need 20 amino acids, and proteins contain that. And of those amino acids, nine are considered essential, which means the body can't make them at all. We have to have them in a diet, just like a vitamin pill. And what we know is that animal proteins basically have a much better distribution of those amino acids than plant proteins. So basically, we're trying to get the right mix and the right amount of those nine essential amino acids and that's what really helps us build body proteins, enzymes, structures, you know, everything that goes on in the body starts with protein. Okay, and you've done quite a lot of research into how much we need, um, you know, why we need that much. You know, there's things like the metabolic signaling aspects of protein. So we've got things like leucine threshold, but also metabolic signaling for brain and gut and, you know, other things as well. So that helps determine how much we should be eating. Yeah. The, the amount of protein that we need, um, we think of it now as a range of intake. And at the very minimum level, which we call the RDA, the Recommended Dietary Allowance, which is set at 0.8 grams per kg, what that does is su supply enough of the protein so we get amino acids to help build new proteins. But as you're suggesting, there are a lot of other roles of these amino acids. Uh, one of them is leucine, which triggers protein synthesis, particularly in muscle. Uh, another one is tryptophan, which is a neurotransmitter uh, it, it's a precursor to serotonin in the brain. Um, and you can go on. I mean, ly lysine is another one that is a precursor to a compound known as carnosine, uh, carnitine, which is basically how we transport fats into our cells to burn them. And so each of these amino acids have other metabolic roles. And the difference is those metabolic rules don't really get going until we have a higher level of protein. So we can meet the minimum need just for kind of building blocks of protein, but all these other signaling and metabolic rules require a higher protein diet. So what are, so what are the other things that protein does in our body? Like we 
all understand that it's involved in, you know, muscle maintenance and muscle synthesis. But, you know, what are the other things? I mean, it's the precursor to pretty much everything, isn't it? Yeah, so like I said, each of the amino acids have different roles. I mean, another one is like arginine is a precursor for nitric oxide, which controls blood pressure and vasodilation of the, of the arteries. So every one of them has other roles. Um, the one that I personally have studied the most is the leucine trigger in muscle. Um, and it basically regulates how and when the muscle goes into an anabolic period, bu building new muscle. And it's interesting that that changes with age. When we're young, that process of building new muscle is really driven by hormones. So children kind of grow because of hormones, insulin, growth hormone, IGF-1. But once we stop growing and we get into our 30s and on into the 40s, now muscle is really controlled by the quality of the diet. And so the amount of protein and specifically the amount of leucine at each meal determines whether muscle stays healthy or not. And we've been researching that now for the last 20 years. And we pretty much understand that. And we understand that we need about 30 grams of protein per meal. We need about three grams of leucine within that protein to keep our muscles healthy. So it's just an, uh, we're evolving at how we understand protein and particularly how we understand it for adults. So you mentioned that the RDA is about 0.8 grams per kg of body weight. Um, what, what would your recommended protein um, you know, doses be? Would you want to go higher than the RDA? Oh, yes. I, the research is absolutely clear that for adults, uh, you can always see uh, health benefits of being above 1.0. So almost all of the recommendations for adults now are that they should fall between 1.0 and 1.8 grams per kg, so double the RDA. Uh, I always recommend 1.2 to 1.6 is the range I always recommend. So we know that to maintain muscle health, to maintain bone health, uh, that you need substantially above the RDA for adults. And how would somebody work out whether they should be closer to the 1.2 or 1.6 level? What, you know, what would determine how you choose that? The other main factor that relates to it, I would, the other two main factors that relate to it are one are your age and the other one is your physical activity. So as you get older, we know that your metabolic efficiency goes down. So you probably need a higher protein diet. You need to continually shift. You need fewer calories as you get older, but you actually need more protein or at least higher quality protein. Uh, and the other is physical activity, particularly resistance exercise. We know that resistance exercise can help blunt the losses of aging, muscle losses. So if you're physically active, resistance exercise uh, in your 40s, you can be at the low end of that range. Uh, as you get toward your 60s, if you're more sedentary, uh, you should get to the higher part of that range. Right, because there's quite a bit of misunderstanding, I think. Older people think they need less protein. Yeah. Um, that's I, mean, the, I mean, the obvious thoughts forever was, well, growing children need more protein because obviously they're growing. But that's not the point at all. That growth only accounts for about 5 to 10 grams of new protein per day. If you look at a 10-year-old or a 16-year-old, the fastest rates of growth, they're only depositing about 5 or 10 grams of new protein per day. But whether you're 16 or 65, you have to replace 250 to 300 grams of protein every day just to stay alive. New enzymes in your liver, new enzymes for your digestive tract, replacing muscle proteins, 250 grams a day. 
And the, what I said a minute ago, as we get older, it's that replacement and repair that is the aging process. We get less efficient at it. And we know that we can blunt that. And we call, the term for that is anabolic resistance. As we get older, we are less able to repair and replace proteins. But we know that the two things that can blunt that effect are resistance exercise and more protein. So for older people, you're definitely recommending lift, getting out there and lifting some weights. Yeah, we need resistance or, I mean, yoga, it's about, it's about stretch against resistance. So yoga is great. You can use rubber bands, you can lift weights, you can go to the gym, but and something that, training. you know, getting up and down out of a chair, walking stairs, all kinds of things are resistance exercise. But as we're doing, sitting in front of a computer is not exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's that's some um, great recommendations. So <clears throat> I had a question. It's just slipped my mind, but it'll come back. So we're talking. So we're talking somewhere maybe between ninety, you know, to one hundred and twenty grams of protein per day for most people. And so we're going to divide that up into meals. How how does that work? You mentioned before that we need thirty grams per meal to get our you know three grams of leucine so you know how are we going to distribute that how important what happens if we don't get that three grams of leucine what happens to that protein that we may have eaten sure good question um the the first thing to do is to is to separate children from that Children, again, are driven by hormones, and so they can eat very small amounts. They could have a breakfast meal that maybe only has 10 grams of protein in it, and they'll grow perfectly fine because their processes are being driven by hormones. Adults, once we're no longer being driven by hormones, now the diet quality comes into effect. What we have discovered was that to trigger in the the protein complex in muscle that regulates this is all called mTOR. Your listeners probably haven't ever heard of it. I think you probably have. But anyway, it's a, it's a complex, sort of like the master control complex in every tissue, but particularly in muscle. And it's sensitive to various things. It's sensitive to leucine, the amino acid, insulin, exercise, energy, lots of different things. What we discovered is that it absolutely has a requirement for leucine of somewhere around three grams. And 2.5 is kind of the minimum. And so using that and looking at the American diet, which is about 70% animal protein and 30% plant protein, that gives us a leucine content of the protein at about 8%. And so if you're after 2.5 grams of leucine, it takes 30 grams of protein to get to it. That's where that number comes from. And that's the absolute minimum. So my recommendation is that adults should have at least two meals per day that are more than 30 grams, someplace between 30 and 55 grams of protein. And that should be at the minimum, the first meal of the day and perhaps the last meal of the day which gives you the biggest anabolic effects. You'll see a lot of things out there. People will talk about even distributions and things like that. And that's not the point. The point is how many meals per day do you get where you exceed that minimum 30 gram number? And I think for most healthy adults, they need to do it at least twice. Okay, so, so then that's, that's about 60 grams. Um, so if they're only hitting 30 grams, that's 60 grams per day. So, right. so, long and so my, my personal approach is that uh, I, at my first meal of the day, and I usually avoid trying to call it breakfast because it's not the time of the day. It's what the first meal is. The first meal, my first meal is around 45 grams and my last meal is around 55. So there I've got a hundred and my middle meal uh, is usually pretty light, maybe 20. So there's my 120. Right. So how do people who are doing intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating um, deal with this? Can Do we need to have a certain time gap between 
consuming the protein or can we eat it in a, in a compressed time frame? Sorry, so, so we were talking so about... Intermittent fasting, so or time yep. associated. So again, when I talk about protein in meals, I avoid using the term breakfast because I want people not to be sensitive to the time so much. So the purpose, the purpose of time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting is to reduce the calorie intake. Most of adults have decreasing calorie needs. We're not super physically active. As we get older, our calorie needs go down. So the question is, how do we control that calories? And one way is just simply eating fewer meals. And so I frankly try to limit my meals to two per day. That's my goal. Um, that then I want the first meal that I eat, I want it always to be high protein and generally low carbohydrate because that first meal you're coming out of a fast. Your body is burning fats and you're also catabolic. You're breaking down muscle tissues and tissues in general. So the way you, the content of that first meal determines your metabolism. So I want it to be high protein to kick the body into a recovery mode. So we're generating new proteins and I want it to stay in a fat burning mode. So I don't want it to be high carb, which triggers insulin and shuts down fat burning. So that first meal I think is very important to your overall health and your metabolic flexibility. Um, time restricted, basically, uh, you can have whatever, six hours or whatever, and your last meal of the day is also high protein. So that I think it fits fine. Intermittent fasting, um, people interpret that in different ways. I'm not a big fan of older adults fasting. I think that, um, you know, up until your mid 40s, I think the body will handle that okay. But when you go into a fast, even as short as, as 36 to 48 hours into a fast, your body starts breaking down protein. And we know from lots of bed rest studies that as you get older, when you break down protein, the body is very inefficient at recovering it. And so I don't think older adults, again, over mid 40s, should really do fasting. We hear people talk about fasting for cleanses and all of that. I think that's total nonsense and frankly, very dangerous for older adults. I think, you know, um, Dr. Fung's done a lot of work and, but I do think sometimes that gets a little bit misunderstood because he's working with really metabolically sick people, you know, extreme diabetes. He's trying to stop people from having, you know, their legs amputated and going blind. And we sort of, um, extrapolate that out into everybody should be doing this, I think, you know, and, you know, things become fads and then they come and go. I, I'm so, not sure I totally understood your point. Are, are you talking about a really low carb diet or I, I'm sure? Well, I was talking about, um, so Dr. Fung, um, are you aware of Dr. Fung? He does the intermittent fasting. Um, so he runs, um, an intermittent fasting clinic and he's very um he's very popular with, sure. with fasting and i mean he's great yeah. i mean he does great he does great work but i think it does get extrapolated out into the general population rather than you know the the data the the research with intermittent fasting and time restricted fasting is pretty positive but the effect of it is basically calorie restriction so it is just another tool to help people. I mean, what the data from all sorts of labs have shown is that if you restrict or fast, uh, you will tend to overeat at the next meal, but not enough to make up for what you skipped. Right. And so the net effect is you eat less calories. Uh, I think that any strategy that allows you to eat less calories is worth considering. So I, I, I don't have any problems with it, but anyone who thinks there's a magical property to it is just being silly. I mean, there's nothing magical about it. It's a calorie balance issue.
And so really we should be prioritizing, prioritizing our protein calories and then looking at our fat and our carbohydrate calories to control that energy intake. One of the things that I think nutritionists have made a huge mistake is over the years we've begun to talk about macronutrients as percentage of calories. And we talk about carbohydrates as 50% or fats as 30% and protein is 15, which kind of minimizes protein. But the reality is protein is the only essential macronutrient and it's related to body weight. So you have to design your diets around protein first and then layer in fat and carbohydrates based on the metabolic outcome and the calories you want. So basically, every meal should start first with a protein decision. And if you're going to make a decision to be high protein, that's fine. If you make a decision to be vegan, that's fine. But then you also have to realize that you have an absolute requirement for resistance exercise, or you're going to have sarcopenia and osteoporosis. You're going to have loss of lean body mass as you get older. So, you know, the vegan protein decision is quite interesting. I mean, there are a few plant foods that are complete um, in essential amino acids, aren't there? You know, you've got soy. Actually, and, not. Oh, none. They mean, they mean, there are no plant proteins that are uh, fully adequate, they're all limiting. So by definition of complete, every protein contains all the essential amino acids. There is no protein that doesn't, with maybe the exception of collagen. Okay, so everyone contains all the essential, but they're not in the right balances. Every plant protein is limiting in one or more of the essential amino acids. Uh, the critical ones are lysine, methionine, tryptophan, and leucine. Every plant is low in one or more of those. Um, plants will be considered adequate. For example, quinoa, everyone's superfood of a few years ago, uh, has 6.0% leucine in it. So to get to your leucine requirement at a meal, having three grams of leucine at a meal would require seven cups of quinoa. Yeah. Okay, so it's adequate. You know, it meets the FAO, the World Health Organization's guideline for a protein, but is incredibly limiting. And so it's all, a lot of that data, a lot of those terms have been developed by the food industry to mask the fact that, the fact that plant proteins are always inferior to animal proteins. Yeah, that's, I'm pleased to hear you talk about that because I did a little exercise um, some time ago where I looked at a range of breakfast diets. So I looked at sort of a um, cereal, soy milk, nuts, and then I looked at, you know, some toast and eggs and bacon and then at, at something like yogurt and, and whey protein. And it was amazing because to get... To get the two point, I worked it on 2.5 grams of leucine, and to get that, the, the cereal breakfast was about 1,300 calories. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, an example that I always like to use is um, one of lysine, an amino acid people don't talk about, but it's probably the single most limiting amino acid in all of the world, lysine. Uh, it's always very low in grain products. And grain products, in the United States, plant proteins, wheat makes up 50% of our plant proteins in the United States. So it's a major issue, but it's very deficient in lysine. So the example I like to use, people talk about complementary proteins. So an example of a complementary protein is you can use a wheat bread with, say, a ro with roast beef. And so one gram of wheat gluten, wheat protein, can be totally balanced with one gram of beef. You have a complementary pair. You can do the same thing with milk. One gram of, say, a wheat cereal can be balanced with one and a half grams of dairy milk, but it takes six and a half grams of soy drink to balance it. So you can have a balanced 
cereal breakfast of, of amino acids with about 10 grams of total protein, which allows you to have like six ounces of milk, but with a soy drink, it takes more than a quart. It takes 33 ounces to balance it. Yeah. And so there are very few mothers out there that might be thinking about something like soy milk or almond milk or you know, some type of juice uh, that basically they're giving to their children a totally amino acid imbalanced diet. So, I mean, that's an interesting point too, because one of the things we hear about plant-based diets is you don't need to get all your amino acids in at the same time, that so long as you get them in over the course of a day or two, that that's sufficient. Is that, what, what are your thoughts about there's that? Some truth to, there's some truth to that. Part of it, um, Part of it sort of diffuses, but something like leucine that we were talking about, that is a meal-to-meal -meal requirement. So if you don't get X amount of the two and a half to three grams of leucine at a meal, you actually asked this question earlier and I forgot it, um, you basically don't trigger muscle repair and recovery. What happens to all those amino acids? Well, the, the body prioritizes amino acids to the liver and to the gut and to the heart and other tissues. So those amino acids will get used and you'll maintain those tissues, but slowly over time, your muscles and your bones will get less healthy. And so without that focus on meals, uh, at the amount at each meal, basically you're going to deteriorate your muscle and bones. Your liver and your total body, your you know, kidney, heart, they'll all sort of look okay, uh, because that's where the body prioritizes it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have to make around 250 grams of protein per day. Of that uh, total amount, only about 25% of it uh, actually goes to all of the muscle. Muscle makes up 50% of all your protein, but it only gets about 25% of your daily turnover. All the rest of it goes to organ tissues. And so that's the reason it is so specific of how we treat muscle. And it's why we see this slow deterioration with aging that we call sarcopenia. It's a slow atrophy of the muscle if we don't take care of it correctly. And looking after the muscle is, you know, obviously a longevity um, issue, isn't it? You know, if we can't get up and down and walk, well then sort of life starts to... I mean, it's mobility, but it's also metabolic health. I mean, insulin resistance, diabetes, starts at muscle. If muscle can't use those carbohydrates, we get diabetic. And, and glucose is one of the most toxic things the body experiences. If muscle's not healthy, we don't burn fatty acids and we get high blood lipids. I mean, muscle is the voluntary sort of secret to having stable metabolism. You, talk, you spoke earlier about mTOR, and then, you know, we talked about insulin. Does insulin um, prevent mTOR from working? Is, is that a, um, um, you know? Insulin is a trigger for mTOR, and when you're growing, it's a major uh, controlling point. When you stop growing, what we know is insulin just has to be present. If you're a type one diabetic, if you're totally devoid of insulin, mTOR won't work. But it doesn't really trigger, I mean, it, it just has to be present. Baseline insulin is plenty. And in fact, amino acids like leucine actually will stimulate an early bolus, an early uh, response of insulin. So that's enough to trigger it. So insulin's not really required. Insulin uh, actually has a feedback to regulate its own receptor and so insulin will actually cause insulin resistance, but it doesn't inhibit. Insulin does two main things. One is stimulate glucose, sugar uptake, and the other is stimulating protein synthesis. When we're young, it does both. When we get older, the only thing it really does is regulate uh, glucose uptake. Right, right. And so that's why we want to be um, controlling that, that, that yeah, those carbohydrates uh, as we get older. I mean, I... I, people talk, I actually just did the same thing that most people did. I said insulin regulates glucose. The reality is insulin is a fail-safe against high glucose. Uh, 
Right. We're best, we're best off actually if insulin is never involved. If we, we have different ways of transporting glucose, for, for example, in muscle, we have a transporter called GLUT4, which is insulin dependent, but we also have a transporter called GLUT1, which is not. And so we can take up adequate amount of glucose into the muscle without ever having insulin uh, requirement, just really baseline levels. But the reason insulin goes up is to prevent toxicity of glucose in the blood. Type 2 diabetes is an example where insulin can no, no longer get high enough to get glucose out of the blood, and we start having all the problems of diabetes. Right. And is um, GLUT2 as well, is that an exercise? Is that, that, is that another non-insulin dependent? GLUT2, if I remember correctly, GLUT2 is exclusively in brain, so brain is not insulin sensitive. Right. Okay. Right, so so the brain can keep using glucose even when we become insulin resistant. Right, Gl glucose is an important brain uh, fuel for the brain and neurons and red blood cells and kidney, and all of those have transporters that are not insulin dependent. Right, 